should submit if you follow me. Scripture this morning comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. If you're reading in the Pew Bible, this is New Testament, page 3. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. 
the Word of God for the people of God. I want to continue on from where Paul left off. When Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fish for people, it says immediately they left their nets and they followed him. And as he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee and his brother John, in a boat with their dad, Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called to them and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. When I was a boy, I loved to fish. And maybe that's why stories from Scripture, like the one that we read today, have always been among my favorites. Because it's not hard for me to picture Peter standing on the shore, throwing out a net with his brother, or being amazed when Jesus knew exactly where to cast to bring in more fish than the nets would hold. Some of my fondest memories in my childhood involve walking through the woods with my dog to fish at the creek behind my house or traveling with my grandfather to fish in every single random cow pasture pond in the county. And like Peter and Andrew and James and John, Christ's fishermen disciples, some of the most important lessons that I've learned about life and about faith have happened standing near the water, wondering what fish lied beneath its surface and what I could do to bring them out into the light. One of the most important lessons that I think about when I read these verses in particular came when I must have been about 11 or 12 years old. See, at that time, my fishing tackle box was a thing of beauty. All right. I had everything, everything that you could possibly have. I was enamored by all of the fishing gear that you could purchase. I had a frog, wasn't a real frog, but a rubber frog that when you'd reel it in, it would kick its legs. I had a plastic bumblebee that was supposed to leap off the water as you reeled and make little circles that were supposed to attract the fish. If there was a color of fishing worm, I owned it. All the little rubber fishing worms, and they were all categorized by color, which was a painstaking process to decide if I wanted to use the color spectrum or some other categorization method. I was serious about this. I had every kind of hook that you could have, every kind of bobber you could have. I even had a bobber that lit up at night so you could cheat and fish at night and, and put a light in the water. And because that stuff wasn't enough, when I sat in on a storytelling session at a uh, national park, I heard a man saying that this certain seed from this certain tree Native Americans used long ago to attract fish. So I got all the seeds from that tree I could put, and I put those in my tackle box as well. I just knew. I knew that having all this gear was going to make me a better fisherman. And I got a rod and reel that matched the awesomeness of my tackle box. That thing could be bent and not break. And it had this open face reel that was built for speed. And I could cast it way out and into any tree I wanted. <laughs> See, I believe this stuff was going to make me better. And when I look back now, I realize that I never caught anything with the frog or the bumblebee or any of those worms, no matter the color. It didn't matter how I organized them, the fish didn't want them. And I think back about it now and I realize that that special rod and reel, I spent more time untangling the bird's nest that it could also create very quickly than I ever did fishing with that pole. Doesn't mean I was a bad fisherman, I just learned how to fish a different way. A way that made all that stuff irrelevant. I'll never forget going fishing with my uncle, my uncle Rodney. We were on the dock one day, and of course, I brought all my gear, my little tower of awesome fishing stuff surrounding me. And I was ready when he came up and surprised that he didn't bring anything with him. Just a container of night crawlers. That's all he had. No pole, no tackle box, no nothing. 
And I was really excited to see what he had in his tackle box to see if there was something new I could go and get. Right? So he shows up and I look at him and I say, Rodney, I thought you came to fish. And he said, I did. And I intend to catch some stuff too if it's biting. I said, how are you going to do that? Before I could finish that sentence, he asked if he could borrow some things from my tackle box, which of course I obliged because I wanted to show off all the cool stuff I had. I didn't know what he was going to take and I was excited to see. Like, how is he going to make some of this stuff work, especially without a fishing pole? And he took out a hook and some line and that was all. I was real disappointed. I had all, he didn't, I mean, I didn't know if he saw all the cool stuff I had. I had that bumblebee. The thing was awesome. But he just took a hook and some line. And I watched as he tied that line to the hook. Not in any fancy way either. Left a tail on there and everything. Baited it with a worm. And then he walked over to the edge of the dock. Let out some of the line in his hand. Still had the spool. And just slowly lowered it down. Until it got all the way to the bottom. And you could see the, the line crumple when there was no more to let out. And then he held one hand out, draped the line over it, and slowly pulled it up. And I watched what this man was doing, and all of a sudden that line goes this way. And I watch him sit here for a second and then do that, and then pull up a catfish. And I don't know who was more surprised in that moment, me or that catfish that he held up that was just wriggling when he looked at me and goes, I think they're biting. <laughs> I thought this might be a, a fluke event. And so as I tried using every manner of cool thing in my tackle box, I watched as my uncle slowly lowered this string down and pull up fish after fish after fish before I finally had enough being outfished by a man with almost nothing. And I said, tell me what you're doing. He said, put down your junk and come over here. He showed me. He said, this is what's happening, Rob. He said, I'm just lowering this worm all the way to the bottom. And then I'm slowly lifting it up to where the fish are. He said, you're trying to bring them to you. I'm just going to them. And you don't need all that mess to go to them. So I clipped the line off my pole and plied off the fishing weights and took the bobber off and spent the rest of the afternoon pulling catfish out from under the dock with my bare hands. And two weeks ago, I realized I still got it because I went down with my kids to Georgia and showed them how to fish the same way and caught something on my first try. It's taken a while. But I realized that what I learned that day is about more than fishing. I realized that it reflects what is most important and most effective if we are trying to share our faith with others. And I realized that it reflects what Christ did and said the very first time he went out and met a bunch of fishermen. Something that I read and that Paul read this morning that speaks to us. There are different versions of this story in Matthew's Gospel. And the way that Matthew's Gospel tells it goes like this. Jesus was baptized and shortly after he was baptized he started to preach by himself. He worked his way upstream from the River Jordan to a lake, the Sea of Galilee, and started preaching in synagogues and wherever folks would have him, all around the lake. And as he's walking, he sees these brothers. This man Simon, who he later names Peter and his brother, and they're throwing a cast net into the water. And this cast net has a special name. In Greek, it's called an amphiblastron. I'll say that again, an amphiblastron. What it is is a round cast net. It's got weights all around the bottom. And the way you fish with it is you throw it out like a giant frisbee, which is very hard to do. And when it hits the water, it goes down and sinks and then traps all the fish in the net. Now, if you've ever fished with a cast net, and some of you probably have, you pull a rope to bring that in and bring the fish in, but that's not how it worked then. It was after you dropped that net that you had to jump in the water. 
and swim into the net and walk around or swim around with a pouch and grab the fish with your hands and stick them in the pouch. That's how they fish. They get caught in the net and you pull them out, stick them in your pouch, and you go up and get air and do it again. It's not an easy process. It's nice to see that hand fishing uh, has a much older root than just my uncle Rodney. So that's what they were doing, and all of a sudden Jesus says something to these men. He's never met them before in Matthew, and he says something unusual. He says, come, follow me. I say that this is unusual and this is strange. It's strange because he's a preacher. Because that's not what preachers said at this time. It's not weird because it's not in the Bible. I counted come and follow me or some variant thereof is in the Bible 1,909 times, give or take. And you're welcome to count and we can compare which ones we counted and which ones we didn't. That comes up a lot, but preachers don't say that because at this time, a preacher or a rabbi, as Jesus was called, didn't go out looking for followers. Followers came to them, came to them to apply and be their student. They didn't go out and they certainly didn't go searching for fishermen. And maybe that's why they threw their nets down, because of this radical invitation. Maybe that's why they didn't ask, who are you and where do you want me to follow? Who knows? Or maybe it was because of what Jesus said afterward. When he says to them, come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Notice that they don't ask any of the questions we might ask. Like, are you even talking to me and who are you? They ask none of that. They just drop their nets and they follow. And if that's not enough, Jesus says it to two guys in a boat off to the side and they drop a different kind of net and they follow and they leave their dad on the boat. And I often wonder what their dad must have thought as they jumped in the water to follow this preacher. To learn from him how to do for others what he has just done for them. How to call out to others from where they are and invite them to follow as well. And how to do so in such a way that people will follow. See, I'm reminded of my Uncle Rodney catching fish without a pole when I look at what Jesus is doing here. He doesn't do what other rabbis do. He doesn't stay in place and entice followers to come to him. Like Rodney raising that worm up from the bottom of the lake to where the fish are, Jesus goes to where these men are. And unlike me, with all my lures and equipment to entice the fish, Jesus just speaks. He performs no miracle to show these men his heavenly authority. He doesn't do a healing or an exorcism. Doesn't turn water into wine. And he does no holy deed of power to amaze and astonish them. He only offers an invitation to be a part of something with him. To learn how to reach out to people and pull them in like these fishermen reach out and pull out fish from that net every day. And that's enough. He offers an invitation that these men answer without question or hesitation. They drop their nets because they know they're not going to need them anymore. Later on, after following Jesus for a while, he lets them in on what they need. What needs to go in their fishers of men tackle box. If you look in Luke, you see that Jesus sends them out two by two. And he says to them, you are being sent out to proclaim the kingdom of God to heal the sick. He told them, take nothing for the journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. Jesus sends them out to meet people where they are and tells the disciples that all you need is two things, to proclaim and to heal, to speak and to care. Your words of faith and your love and action because of that faith are going to be enough. I want you to notice that these two things, our words and our deeds, are the same two things that we promise to do when we get, when we get baptized. They're the same things I asked John when he was being baptized right there. If he promised to follow Christ in word and deed throughout his life. It's the same questions that were asked of many of you 
and have been asked of disciples of Christ from the very beginning. Do you believe in Christ as your Lord and Savior, and do you promise to follow him in word and deed throughout your life? When we read the story of these disciples, of how Jesus called them, of how he sent them out to fish for people, we need to read this knowing that this is not an isolated event. It is not just for some fishermen. It's a lesson for each of us. We are all called to be disciples. Each one of us are called, just as they are, to be fishers of people, to share with others who Christ is, to invite them to be a part of Christ's family. We know this. Deep down, we know this. Doesn't change the fact that we don't often do that. Not often. And not well sometimes. You see, we're often hesitant. Hesitant to share our faith. Hesitant to invite others into Christ's family or to invite others to sit with us in church. Hesitant to be the fishers of men that we promised to be at our baptisms. When we answered yes to following Christ in word and in deed. And maybe the reason for this hesitancy is the fact that we don't think we have the right tools for the job. That we can't be fishers of men without seminary training or extensive knowledge or a stack of Bibles or commentaries that we have read and highlighted. Maybe we think we need to have all the answers. We need to realize that we'll, the same thing I realized on that lake long ago. What those disciples realized when they put their nets down. And what was shared to them the moment before Jesus sent them out. That all that stuff isn't what we need. Christ has already given us everything we need. We're making it far too complicated. I fish better with a line, a hook, and my hands than I ever did with all that stuff. And I fish better for people with my words and my care than all of the seminary training that I paid so much money for, that I spent so much time and effort on, and all the books that line my walls and my office and flood into my home. My words and my care matter more. Maybe we struggle to do this because we spend too much time trying to get folks to come to us instead of meeting them where they are. I've been around long enough to know that new buildings and free food and special events can get people to come into a church. But all these things and more aren't near as effective at getting people to become a part of a family, a church family, than meeting people where they are and offering the same invitation that Christ offered at that shore to come and to follow. Christ's word to us this morning is to do what he did at that lay. To go out and to meet people where they're at. To speak and to care. To share how Christ changed us. How his words spoke to us. To invite folks to come and see our God through the love of his son. Through the church family that loves us through him. Christ is calling each of us to be his fishermen. And we don't need tackle boxes full of shiny gear to do so. Your story is enough. Christ's love is enough. So drop your nets. Leave your pole on the dock to dry rot. And bring only what you need. And see for yourself how powerful this is. I want to end today not with my words. I want to show you with your own words how powerful it is to just share your faith, your hope, your love of the people in this room. Turn your attention up here. This is the video that was made months ago. You might remember when a young man came here to make a video of us so that we can share our faith with others. I want to show that to you for the first time this morning.
community is filled with lots of people who are very different from all over the country. Uh, and First Baptist Church is the kind of place where everybody is welcome. The community within the church is very warm and accepting. People here show love toward one another, and it's reflected in actions. Prayer is a vital part of who we are. Every gathering I was ever in includes prayer. It's a place where anybody can come and have an encounter with God, have an encounter with the sacred. As I sit and worship here with the powerful preaching and great music, I am able to to have that worshipful communion with God. Every single one of our worship services, we have a sign language interpreter here to interpret the sermon and the songs and the prayers and everything so that whether you are hearing or not, you are able to worship just the same as everyone else. Many of us who sit on um, what I call the organ side of the church sit there because we want to watch um, our deaf interpreter sign and we also love watching our hearing impaired members listen and worship and smile when they do. Many of the most important relationships that are formed among families happen through Sunday school. People are willing to share personal experiences in their living and how God has moved and is moving and the things they struggle with. All of that is put on the table. Because of it, there is a closeness in that class that I have not experienced in another place. Baptist Church of Fayetteville does a beautiful job of serving the surrounding community. We believe at First Baptist Church that every single member of our church is a pastor, is a minister, is a prophet in this world. And what that means is going to be different for everybody. Some of us are called to be ministers in our jobs and in our work and in our schools. And here at this church, we want to encourage you, support you, and foster you in those ministries. I no longer think, let me go do this because it's going to make me feel good. It is now because this is helping somebody else, and, and that's what love demands of me. And I think that's the spirit of this church. First Baptist Church is a family. First Baptist Church is a home. First Baptist Church is a sacred place. It's a headquarters, a launching point for service. It's a place of discernment. It's a place of prayer. We are music. We are art. We are builders. We are flood cleanup crews. We are proud of the family that we are here at First Baptist. We are proud of the diversity that our congregation represents. We are guided by and motivated by our love of God and our love of others. Is your words, your experience, your faith is enough. We didn't create this so that we can share with the world that we have a good church. We created this so that we can share with the world that we have a great God. Amen. We end every single worship service with a charge. I figure if you've come in this room, I'd like to hope you got something here to take out there. And so this morning we end with a charge, but also with something to take with you. I want you to take your story with you. I want you to take your care with you when you go out into this place. And this video that you saw, I've got these in these containers here. And if you'd like, I invite you to take one of those with you. Because if you want to add our story to your story, when you share your faith with somebody, when you invite them to come, by all means. But know that if you take one of those, it ain't for you. It is earmarked by the Holy Spirit for somebody else. And I am fairly sure you know exactly who you want to share that with. May we remember more than anything that the world needs us to go where people are. And that we don't have to be anything other than what we are to be enough 
to share Christ's love and be his fishers of people. Amen.